OK, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so um, my name is Stephen Bevan. Um, I'm an associate director at the Institute for Employment Studies, which is a um, research um, and consultancy charity we set up in 1969. Uh, we're based in Brighton. Uh, we have 45 people and I suppose the thing that defines what we do is that we try and provide informed evidence based commentary on what's going on in the world of work, both in the wider labour market, but also in workplaces. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work, as you can imagine, um, during the pandemic. Um, and we have some reflections on how well that's worked in terms of work organisation, um, health and work and so on. We're doing quite a big project with um, colleagues at Southampton Business School funded by the SRC called Work After Lockdown. Um, and if you do a Google search for that, you'll find all sorts of data from various surveys and things that we've been doing so since day one of the pandemic, actually since one, day one of the lockdown. Um, but we do a lot of work on um, a range of HR policies and practices, performance management reward and so on. We just published something um, this week with the CIPD looking at ethnicity pay gap reporting and so on. Um, and one of the things that we're interested in is to what extent are some of the the recent trends in the world of work likely to continue uh, into the future. So I'm going to focus a bit more on um, some of the future issues um, and speculate a little bit about some of the things that may or may not happen. Um, over the last two years, um, there have been a more intensified debate, I suppose, about the ability of big organisations and small organisations to change and adapt the nature of the psychological contract that they have with their employers. Um, and employees, sorry, um, and of course the ways that the future work itself will evolve. And so what I want to do today is take a critical look at some of the social, economic, technological forces that are like to shape the future of work uh, over the next decade or so. And, and in doing so, I want to assess whether the changes forced on us by the pandemic will result in a permanent shift in working patterns and employee preferences. And I also want to take a sober look at the history of the future of work. Um, just to see how well our previous predictions about changes in the workforces and workplaces have worked out in practice and what we might learn from that. Um, and in putting together these thoughts, I was preoccupied by three questions, which I hope uh, to address in presenting some data and some analysis and some, some of my arguments. So the first is what are the main drivers of the dynamism that organisations will have to uh, have or develop post COVID? Um, we've, we've all been through a shock um, and as we've heard already, some of those shocks have been positive uh, and some have been negative. Secondly, are we seeing a revolution in the way that we work or will things revert to normal, whatever that is? And then what are the big questions that HR professionals will need to answer in response to the drivers and to the changing employee expectations? So um, what I'm going to do is structure my presentation around four of the big factors that will force organisations to adapt and change. I recognise these aren't the only ones. Um, so, for example, we've already had environment and sustainability raised as a big strategic issue, diversity and inclusion. All of those are really important and are probably of equal status to the four that I've chosen. But um, in the limited time I've got, I'm going to focus on these four. Um, let's have a look at first one on demographics and health. Um, one of the things that's um, been really clear over the last 20 or 30 years, and it's one of the few things um, in the labour market that we can predict with any certainty, which is ageing. Um, and we obviously we've seen um, a big shift in the age profile of the workforce in the UK. Many, many other developed Western economies have seen a very similar ageing process. We know in the UK um, that over 65s are going to account for almost two thirds of employment growth to 2060. And that's where most of the job growth is going to come. Um, so we need to be better as employers uh, at managing uh, multi-generational workforces. Already one in 10 men and one in 20 women are working beyond 65. That's a really significant factor. Um, what we have found, however, during the pandemic, there's been a drop in a, uh, by at least 300,000 in economic activity rates amongst the over 50s. Now, it's unclear quite why this has happened. It's clearly something to do with early retirement decisions, something to do with ill health um, and possibly some other reasons. And in some cases that may be due to work intensity. So we've got a lot of news, for example, at the moment about GPs and the pressure they're under. 
We've seen um, a, a, a big increase in early retirement in uh, road haulage and HDV drivers and so on. So it may be that some of the, this drop in uh, economic activity amongst over 50s can be linked to some of the current labour shortages that we're experiencing. But it is worth remembering that uh, amongst those people who do retire, 25% come back to work within five years. And mostly that's not for financial reasons. It's mostly because they miss work and they miss um, social contact and so on. So the idea that retirement is a fixed cliff edge that people fall off um, is, has never been really very true, certainly over the last 15, 20 years when we scrapped the statutory retirement age. Um, and retirement will be a much more fluid uh, process uh, where people will come in and back into work um, as well. We've also got the challenge demographically of low birth rates. Um, so um, we need, for example, from a demographic point of view, we need every woman of childbearing age, I don't know if we're still allowed to say that, um, to have 2.1 children during their lifetime. Um, it's currently 1.58. That's just to keep the population stable. In 1964, it's 2.93, for example. Um, and one of the challenges we've got very dramatic shifts in the in the um, composition of the workforce and the working age population. And of course, our definition of what the working age population is, is shifting. It's not just people up to 65. There are people working beyond 70, for example, very commonly now. Uh, workforce health, and Carrie's obviously majored on that in his presentation. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that despite everything, um, the combination of musculoskeletal conditions and mental health has remained the persistent two highest uh, conditions that affect um, sickness, absence, presenteeism, lost productivity at work. Um, those to be old enough to remember 1979, the winter of discontent, we lost 29 million working days um, through uh, strike action. Um, it's consistently both MSK and stress have accounted for over 30 million working days lost each year over the last few years, even though sickness absence levels have gone down. Um, just a quick word for data geeks like me, in 10 years time when we look back on the last two years in terms of sickness absence data, we're going to be screwed. We have no idea what's happened to sickness absence um, because how do you define what you know, work, if work is not a place and is an activity, how do we measure sickness absence and, and attendance at work is going to be uh, a bit of a nightmare. Um, what is also clear is that um, poor workforce health um, has a big impact on both labour supply and the productive capacity of the workforce. And obviously with ageing that come, becomes more complex as well. So here's some forecasts based on um, various sources of data looking at the proportion of the working age population who will have a long term health condition, at least one long term health condition by 2020. Um, and you can this basically represents about 40% um, of the UK working age population. Um, so it's not a minority pursuit. Um, you can see mental illness and musculoskeletal uh, dominate, but also asthma, cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, diabetes, coronary heart disease, stroke um, are affecting more people of working age, partly because um, we've got people working much longer um, because of you know, pension crisis, um, and people's preferences to work longer. And the other thing to bear in mind is between 25 and 30 percent of people have more than one condition. So from an organisational capability point of view, um, we're going to have to be dealing with more people with more complex health needs over the next 20 or 30 years than we've been used to doing over the last 20. And this is something that is definitely affected more by ageing. So we can see here, this is the last depressing graph, I hope, um, that the proportion of people who have more than one health condition grows massively as they age, perhaps unsurprisingly. And what we've seen here is if you if you drew a line at the 60 to 64 point, a vertical line, that will be the traditional point at which people would retire. Now that line's shifted to the right because our work definition of working age has shifted as well. Um, in fact, it's a very blurred line. So one of the challenges we have is from a workplace point of view, as well as from a public health point of view, how do we manage in the future the fact that more people will have work limiting health conditions? These health conditions don't necessarily mean they'll leave the labour market. Uh, it just means that they'll have more need for support for both from the NHS, but also from employers. 
And I'd add to Carrie's um, primary, secondary and tertiary list a little bit by saying that you know prevention is really important as part of this process. And we carry talked about doing stress audits and risk assessments and so on. There's been a requirement on employers since 1974 to do an annual psychosurgical risk assessment in the workplace. Put your hand up if you do one every year. Yeah, that's the normal number, zero. Um, it's a legal requirement, but people aren't doing it. Um, we've detected that more and more organisations have been doing stress, stress risk assessments during the pandemic, because back to one of the earlier questions about how do you do this remotely, um, more and more organisations have been concerned about stress um, amongst people working from home. But one of the things we really need to look at is how do we identify the early signs in the way that work is organised and jobs are designed and people are managed at work that may expose them to an elevated risk of psychosocial risk, um, health risks. Job retention is really important. So if people are ill or develop a health condition, how do we make sure that we're making adjustments at work to, um, to allow them not just to keep in work, but allow them to have opportunities for progression um, and career development um, at work? It's not enough just to say you have a disability or a long-term health condition, you should be grateful to have a job. Um, we should expect people to have equal rights uh, to progression and to good quality work. Um, this means that line managers, and I agree completely with what Kerry was saying about the central role they play, have to be much more skilled at job redesign. We know that autonomy, control, um, task discretion, all the things that Kerry talked about, absolutely pivotal, not just to workplace productivity, but to workplace well-being. And we need managers to be really skilled in understanding how tactical, um, sometimes short term changes to people's um, workload, um, to the the way that their uh, their tasks are ordered or how much autonomy they have over their tasks are done and li line managers quite often have been used to be in a situation where they take top down control over the way that jobs are designed there's much more interest now in this concept of job crafting where individuals are playing a much more active part in redesigning their jobs to allow them to cope and to allow them to take on new challenges we also need to make sure that we're managing return to work so occupational health professionals um, quite often um, are patching people up and getting them back to work. They're not doing as much as they'd like to do in terms of surveillance, monitoring, risk assessment. We need to focus on the skills of and the discipline of vocational rehabilitation. I've got some colleagues I work with here up in uh, Salford University who are really good on uh, physiotherapy and vocational rehabilitation. The, the power of vocational rehab is a really important um, uh, set of disciplines that organisations aren't accessing and they really should. So these will not be minority pursuits over the next 20 years as a high proportion of the workforce lives with a long term and chronic condition. And of course, from a macroeconomic point of view, having a high proportion of your workforce with an ill health problem affects the productive capacity of the workforce. So let's next look at the second issue that I raised, which is about productivity and the long term long term changes in the labour market and how work is organised. So as Carrie said, we've got a pretty poor record in the UK comparatively to other OECD countries in terms of productivity. Um, it's only really just before the pandemic that UK labour productivity achieved the same levels as it was at just before the financial crisis. Um, and of course, um, things have dipped since then as well. So we, we could reliably, before the crisis, rely on uh, UK um, productivity to be to grow by 2% a year. We measure productivity by output per hour worked. Um, and um, I think one of the interesting things, and one big question that uh, has been raised by lots of CEOs is whether or not productivity is held up during the, the, the crisis. Um, we've been doing this work with um, Southampton University where we've been measuring whether or not um, productivity has been affected by people working from home. And by and large, we found that it hasn't been affected at all. Um, there are some uh, occupational groups where it's been uh, been down, but others where it's been increased. And this has been echoed by data analysis by Alan Felstead at um, Cardiff University and various other studies uh, using national data sets that suggest that actually labour productivity hasn't really been damaged too much by people working from home. However, um, our data suggests really strongly that people with positive mental health 
are twice as productive as those people with mental health problems who've been working from home. So it's not a universal truth that everyone's productivity is held up. Um, and the, the dynamics affecting mental health during lockdown has been very interesting. And I'm going to be back again to one of the themes that Carrie was talking about that those people who had most frequent contact with their line managers also had better mental health. Those people working most closely to their contracted hours also had better mental health. We found about a third of people had presenteeism, uh, so were working when they were ill during lockdown whilst working from home. Um, and we found that younger people had worse mental health problems, partly because of their living conditions, partly because they um, the sort of social deficit of, of not being able to work closely with colleagues and so on. So it's been a quite a mixed picture. Um, and certainly uh, productivity is something that um, is something that I think employers really need to take a lot more seriously. And one of the problems is that too many employers don't actually measure productivity. Um, if you're in a knowledge business or a service sector business, it's actually quite hard to measure productivity in the conventional sense of looking at output per hour worked. Um, it's quite hard to measure output sometimes. And the problem about this is that in some sectors of the economy, it's possible to increase your profits massively whilst um, product productivity stagnates or declines. Uh, and sometimes the, the search for profit can crowd out the search for productivity increase. So in some sectors, it's easier to recruit low, pay low paid staff and maintain your profits. And that crowds out investment in technology and skills. So we know from a economic point of view that if we invest in technology and invest in skills and human capital that we're likely to see an increase in productivity. Pre-COVID both capital investment and skill investment by employers were at historically low levels um, and we've not seen much of a shift since then. So if we are going to increase productivity it's not just about making sure people got the right kit and the right skills but it's also that they're well enough and we need to see wellness and well-being as a factor of production um, and that's one of the themes from the book that we've been talking about as well. Um, the other thing I want to chat about briefly is um, the nature of the, the uh, work and, and the way that labour market is structured because I suppose there's a question about how much tolerance for drama the UK labour market has. There's been quite some disruptive forces and of course there's lots of commentary around precarious work, zero hours contracts, the gig economy, the end of the job for life and yet when you look historically at what's happened to the UK labour market over the last 20 or 30 years the data shows a remarkable amount of stability. So here's some data just from 1996, 2008 and 2016. This is all pre-pandemic looking at different aspects of the way the labour market has been structured. And you can see here a remarkable amount of similarity across the years, despite all the disruption, you know, the financial crisis, growth of technology, uh, growth of precarious work and so on. The share of permanent employee jobs hasn't changed very much at all. In fact, it went up a little bit. Share of people in full time employment um, hasn't changed very much. Share of part time employment uh, hasn't changed very much. Share of self employment went up. Um, considerably, although actually during the pandemic that's gone down again by almost a million. The share of people in temporary jobs has gone down, it's never been above 10%, um, but the conventional wisdom is that everyone's in a, in a precarious job and the labour market is very flaky, not borne out by the data. Um, share of other employments, that's people on government schemes and so on, it's relatively small. Share of people's second jobs has come down, share of people on zero hours contracts of course went up but actually it's come down during the pandemic by, by a tiny percentage um, but still down and the total amount of the labour market um, that is uh, a tr that's accounted for by the so-called gig economy so all these different types of non-standard working arrangements is still only four percent so the lesson from this is that um, there's a huge amount of you could argue in a sense the labour market is actually very flexible and although it bends and weaves with the shocks it always has a tendency to go back to this core model which is primarily uh, permanent work uh, despite what we hear. Now that's not to say we shouldn't be very careful about um, um, unfortunate and sometimes exploitative labour practices in terms of precarious work, the effect that has on people's health, the fact it has on their job security, on their families and so on, that needs to be looked at um, and we need to make sure that we don't relax um, labour legislation to, to make that more easy for organisations to do. Um, what I would say that 
So what do we know about what's happened to these data over the last couple of years? We know, for example, that part time working is in a big shift. Um, we've now got um, the lowest ever share of female employment in part time work than we've ever had. Um, so women particularly have been affected by uh, the recession. I've also already mentioned that um, self-employment has also come down from 5 million to just over 4 million, so 15% drop in self-employment. My prediction would be that would flex back to where it was eventually over a period of time. The other thing that's talked about pretty regularly is what, what we what it's called the great resignation um, after COVID. There was a study that Microsoft did uh, in 2021 that suggested about, you know, over 40% of people were going to be resigning uh, during 2022. Um, so what does recent history tell us about this um, and the, the, the churn in the, in the labour market? Again, I've just chosen two data points 20 years apart, uh, 94 and 2014. Um, this is basically the average amount of time people spend in their job um, with the same employer. The interesting thing is that, um, again, despite the conventional wisdom, the average employment relationship lasted 8.2 years in 2014 compared with 7.9 years in 1994. If I'd asked you to push, have a show of hands, you'd almost all of you would have said, that job tenure has come down dramatically. Not true, not borne out by the data. In 2014, 54% of people have been their current employer for at least five years, compared with 47% in 1994. So it seems to me that there's a lot of people talking up the great resignation um, and a permanent shift in um, greater precariousness and greater mobility and so on. And of course, we see that cyclically anyway. The labour market follows the, the trend of the, the wider economy um, and it's linked to the buoyancy of the labour market. So, of course, when you've got a very tight labour market and lots of other opportunities for people, particularly those with skills and who, who are highly marketable, they will churn. That does happen, um, but it is just part of the general landscape. So is this part of a permanent shift? I don't think so. Um, that's not what my instinct tells me. And if you look back at the history of the future of work, um, these data suggest that there's an enormous amount of stability built into and resilience built into the labour market. So, as I say, lots of stability. I suppose um, there are questions about whether COVID and to an extent Brexit will disrupt this stability dramatically. I think hybrid working is certainly, of course, on the agenda. We have from our own surveys, 70 to 80 percent of people want to work two days at home and three days, sorry, three days at home and two days in the office. Um, that's borne out recently by some da new data from the Office of National Statistics just this week that put that figure at about 85 percent. There's this interesting idea about the ideal, um, which is the notion that individuals will start negotiating their own flexible working arrangements, um, very individualised. So a few years ago, I worked with an Australian bank and what they said was we're getting lots of requests for flexible working. We're going to develop four different models um, which you can opt for, like a menu, so as a job sharing model, a compressed hours with working model and so on. Uh, come and talk to your manager or an HR person if you want to opt for one of those, but that's the limit of the flexibility we're going to offer. What's happening now is more and more people are saying, well, because of my own personal circumstances, I want to work this particular pattern of work. In fact, in my own organisation, probably about 15 people out of 45 are working um, five day a week. Um, we've got so, one person in my team is the only person who works on a Friday. Um, now that causes some interesting operational issues. So if you have a very permissive bottom up approach to ne negotiating individual deals, the danger is you can't cover the work. So one of the challenges for HR people um, is how do you manage that in a way that is consistent, fair, doesn't set a precedent, isn't discriminatory and so on. It's a big challenge. Um, and although it sounds like a great idea, um, organisations are finding that to be a bit of a tricky problem to, to manage. And I think there's another issue about that, which I'll come on to a bit later about uh, collective bargaining. Um, we're seeing labour shortages in key sectors um, and Brexit and Covid have had um, an exacerbating effect on that, particularly in some sectors like agriculture, hospitality, road haulage and so on. Precarious work, we talked a little bit about that. That will always be a feature, but I think it's important not to over-egg it. Two new things that have come on the agenda, um, which 
you know, people like Carrie and I have heard of, known about for a long time, but it's only become prominent recently, are the concept of burnout and moral injury. And these are different aspects of psychological well-being at work, which are affecting people in particular occupations. Uh, we know that uh, burnout is a big issue amongst general practitioners uh, in the health sector, but in other sectors too. The thing about burnout that's different from depression or anxiety is that it's accompanied by um, massive cynicism, physical exhaustion, um, fatigue that is not resolved by sleep, um, and demoralisation. And I think that's one of the things that we'll see, which probably will extend over the next few years as more and more people find themselves in jobs that are just not possible to do. And moral injury is a related issue, which is certainly found um, most recently in the NHS, where people who have a vocation to deliver care uh, find they're not able to do that. And actually they're being asked to make decisions and um, put into practice things that they know are against what their training says. So not allowing relatives to come and hold a hand of a dying patient provides a real crisis, not just of course for the patient and their relatives, but for the healthcare professional. And moral injury is an interesting um, dimension of um, psychological well-being at work, well, I think we'll hear a lot more of. We talked about the great resignation, so I won't go into that in more detail. Technology. So technology is often identified as a disruptive force, which has historically accompanied changes in the nature of work and how it's done. And this needn't necessarily be high tech. Um, Peter Salisbury, who used to be managing director of M&S, once told me that the biggest step change in retail labour productivity was the adoption of the shopping trolley. Um, so it can be small things that make a big difference. Uh, it's also notoriously difficult to predict how and at what speed technology will transform work and greater minds than mine have made fools of themselves by trying to do so. Uh, the quote in blue is Kevin Keegan. I just couldn't resist that one. Um, the quote below is from a esteemed Nobel Prize winner who basically said, I won't read it out to you, but we've discovered all the important things so we needn't bother trying anymore. That was 1903, so that was before Einstein was uh, about. Um, the telephone. Too many serious shortcomings, won't be any very value to us. Trains, can't go fast on a train because you'll die of asphyxia. Here's my favourite one. Um, chairman of IBM, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Uh, back in the days when a computer with less of the processing power in your than in your watch would fill this room. And then perhaps a bit of perspective, which I think is um, a very true statement about technology, is that we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. And I think that's pretty much true of all the technological developments that we've seen and therefore should frame the way we expect technology to affect work. So there's lots of breathy journalistic commentary and hyperbole and speculation um, about this debate, but not much data. Um, and of course, lots of consultancies are really interested in creating a bit of um, anxiety about technology uh, in order to sell business. Um, I think there's been a lot of hype about whether technology will destroy jobs. I think it's pretty now pretty much a consensus now that technology will create more jobs than it destroys. Um, now, it's actually quite hard to tell what some of those new jobs will be, but um, I went to visit recently a big insurance company looking at the way they're using AI and robotics to manage the customer service interface and so on. And one of the things they've done really well is to make sure that they're taking out routine elements of jobs of customer service agents and using technology to automate routine things, but enrich the jobs of those customer service agents. They've not lost any jobs. Everyone who's been affected by the technology has been given more to do, more responsibility and more career development. So it's possible to implement technology without destroying jobs or make people redundant. But history tells us that productivity gains from technology can only be achieved with a similar investment in human capital. Now, there's still a long tail of laggardly or Luddite organisations that make adoption of technology patchy at the very best. And we know that in some areas, technology is very provider led. I'm doing a review at the moment looking at um, the use, use of mood tracking apps on smartphones. And one of the interesting things is that the biggest um, distributor of mood tracking apps are insurance companies. Um, and also we know that um, a vast majority of mood tracking apps only get downloaded 5,000 times or less. 
Um, so there's a very provider led aspect to some of these technologies. Um, and there's some big questions about what problem those apps are supposed to be solving. So technologies have trans transformative potential, but it's too often scuppered by poor implementation, cultural barriers, lack of trust and so on. We know there's a lot of hype about robotics, human augmentation, wearables, remote sensing technology and so on, and they've all got a part to play and they will have an incremental impact over a period of time, which is conditioned by our ability to assimilate them and to diffuse them through the organisation. Um, but they do require good people processes to exploit their potential fully. There are ethical issues about data, privacy, issues around surveillance. Um, you know, how happy are you to have your performance managed remotely via technology? We of course know, you know people move their mouse every half an hour when they're working at home just to make sure that um, their boss knows they're still alive and so on. But various technologies like the British Airways have had this trial looking at mood blankets, you know, to pick up through brain waves, whether or not you're happy or sad if, if you're under a blanket on the on the airplane, blue if you're happy, etc. There's voice and re face recognition to, to monitor people's stress. There's even a study I found recently that looks at um, muscle tension in your arm as you use your mouse to, as a way of identifying uh, stress as well. So there's lots of technology out there. Um, I'm just generally cynical based on our previous experience of the extent to which mass adoption of that technology will have a short term transformative effect either on productivity or engagement. And the, finally, the COVID accelerator effect. Um, we've talked quite a bit about all this already. Um, it's clear that the lockdown and the pandemic and so on have accelerated some innovations in work, working practices that were already in the pipeline. Um, and I think to an extent, as, in the, as I say in the last point, we have leapfrogged um, quite quickly um, some of the developmental and evolutionary changes in the adoption of these practices. Um, and I suppose the challenge is, is to hang on to the best of those. Um, and that is a challenge, of course. Um, the problem is, as Carrie was saying about his, you know, the Radio 4 interview this morning, it's almost become a politicised issue. Uh, this issue about whether working at home is a good thing or not. Um, so the, the CEO of Goldman Sachs called working from home an aberration, which they would correct. Um, so James Dyson um, also said something similar recently, where he said that people who will come back to work were diligent, and those people who've been working from home were cocooned, um, which is interesting. Particularly given in um, his Desert Island Discs um, program that he did with Sue Lawley a few years ago, he was boasting that he did most of the development of his um, vacuum cleaner at home. Iron is dead. Um, but things like virtual teams, flexible working, hub and spoke workplaces, hybrid and four day working week and so on, have all been experimented with um, for many years, but um, they begin a boost by um, the pandemic. Um, and so it could well be that for some of these things, um, and I think certainly the desire amongst employees to work more flexibly, we're seeing a slightly irresistible shift. And it's something that some employers are finding difficult to deal with. And that's partly because they're trying to find a solution for everybody that fits, fits everybody. Um, here's just one way of thinking about it. Um, to what extent are the jobs that you've got in your organisation um, location dependent or independent? or time dependent or independent? And of course, the answer is um, it varies enormously according to the jobs that you have in your organisation. Um, you know, if you're um, a hairdresser, um, then you're in the bottom left hand quadrant. You know, the production and consumption of hairdressing has to be co-located in the jargon. Um, whereas if you're an author, you can work at any time and in any place. And of course, the, the challenge for organisations is that this this model works differently for different people in different job roles or even for tasks within a job. So the whole workforce can't fit into one quadrant. It needs a tailored response. And it seems to me that this model represents some of the dynamics of the challenges that organisations are going through at the moment in trying to find the best fit between what their employees want, uh, what the business imperative is without um, affecting uh, damagingly the competitive advantage of the organisation. So this all represents a big challenge for HR professionals uh, across a range of areas and I won't have time to go through all of these but it just seems to me that we've got an opportunity to see whether or not our core HR processes are now fit for purpose given the new reality. 
uh, particularly with hybrid working, performance management, rewards, accession, recruitment, induction, you know, how to onboard people while they're working remotely has been, been a challenge for many organisations. Whether these new ideals represent a, the death of collectivism, you know, what happens in unionised environments where everyone is doing their own deal? Um, what happens to collective bargaining, the role of um, trade unions and so on? I don't think anyone's really thinking about that. Um, not even some of the unions, but they ought to be. Um, to what extent are, have we learned more about what it is that motivates and engages people and in what circumstances? You know, have we got too static a model of what human motivation at work means? I think we've got a re great opportunity to really um, get under the skin of that and try and reevaluate where we are and whether people have different motivational needs at different points in their life cycle. Um, there's a big test, of course, as Carrie was emphasising um, on um, the quality of line management and leadership. Uh, there's been a study that's been done repeatedly now by colleagues at the London School of Economics and um, MIT, which has looked at what are the drivers of productivity in at firm level. And their data consistently shows, this is John Van Rienen, um, that the quality of management is the biggest driver. Um, and of course, you can invest in technology, of course, you can um, invest in skills, but the quality of the management um, of these organisations is the key differentiating factor in what drives productivity at the level of the firm. And we're just not investing enough in, in the quality of management. Have we learned to value outputs over inputs uh, in terms of the way that we manage performance? Um, have we achieved a dramatic pivot um, in response to working from home that has meant that we've taught ourselves about the level of organisational agility and resilience that we didn't know we had. So if you were making gin last week, but making hand gel the following week, what is it about the transformative processes that you engaged in at really short notice to pivot from one activity to another that you can use and embed in your culture and your management practices to make sure that you're better equipped for the future? You know, organisations have proved they can transform very quickly. Um, therefore, the objections to change uh, have been undermined. And that's certainly been the case for lots of line managers who said, oh no, working from home could never work for us, because it has, it, you know, dominantly for most people. Social capital is really important, particularly in knowledge-based business. We know that people value micro interactions, opportunities for conversations, tacit knowledge is a really so important uh, component of competitive advantage in knowledge-based organisations. To what extent do we need to build that back um, to, in, to compensate for the fact that people, many people have been isolated from working at home. How do we um, engender that? How do we need to change the way we think about involvement in, in participation in decision making amongst individuals? How much do we need their consent for change? Uh, whereas previously we just told them what to do. And then there's a big issue for me against about what the role of the HR is in terms of um, ethical stewardship and moral compass of business. There's a recent study that showed that 51% line managers said they've been asked to do something they felt ethically uncomfortable with. Now, where is HR in all that? You know, in, during all this change, when employee health became a, a business continuity issue, where HR people had conversations at board level, where are they using that influence to make sure that organisations are doing the right thing? There are still HR managers I took to who told by their chief executives, we want you to do this, um, and at the same time as implementing it, keep us out of tribunals. You know, that's your job as an HR person. Um, is that acceptable anymore? I'm not sure it is. So there's still a lot up for grabs. Um, I think my overall point is that um, there's a great amount of certainty and stability in the way the labour market tends to respond to these things. And we shouldn't get overexcited by some, by some of the more excitable um, speculation. Um, we should certainly embrace the change that we've been through. But it does seem to me that we've had some rich ex um, examples and opportunities for learning and reflection over the last couple of years. Um, and we need to decide which of those we need to capture most urgently. And we need to ask ourselves whether we can embrace um, benefit from the opportunities that the future offers, um, particularly if we fail to upgrade the UK's management cap capacity. And end of lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So, yeah, thank you very much. It's a very interesting um, presentation. Thank you. Um, I, I know it's always really irritating when someone asks about a data point that you discussed. I'm not questioning the data in any way, but when you talked about the average length of um, service that an, an employee was done and there wasn't significant change over, over, you know, over the last 20 years, it's kind of countered the analysis that we've done within the company that I work in where we see most of our churn occur in the you know the first and second years yeah. Yeah. so i wondered if if the if if you did that same analysis that you've done and looked at a, you know a, perhaps a younger proportion of the population and worked it out against you know total available working life or something like that would yeah. the figures be any different no i think you're right i mean we we presented this i remember presenting this data to a big retailer and they they said the same thing they were shaking their heads saying you know you don't know what you're talking about um and of course no, 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 I know you're not, no. Um, and of course, what you find, particularly in large organisations, is a sort of um, you know, great level of churn during the first two or three years. Um, that can be considerably higher than that. And obviously there are big sectoral differences. We know that in hospitality, retail, um, you know, and some other sectors, labour turnover is, you know, averaging 15, 20, 25 percent or more. Um, so um, those figures do mask quite a lot of variation. But I suppose the striking thing is that if you take it in aggregate in terms of looking at the total amount of movement in the labour market, um, it absolutely goes against the conventional wisdom that, you know, everyone's a butterfly and everyone's moving around the whole time. Most people have got full time mortgages. Um, you know, the idea that they can afford to, to flit around, um, you know, particularly at later in their career as developing commitments and you know, having families and so on. So you definitely do see an age and to an extent a length of service differentiator. People have, with short service tend to be, have a higher risk of, of, of churn. I think if you looked at the graduate labour market just by itself, you'd see, you know, sort of, um, you know, one of the ways, some of the ways that big graduate recruiters measure churn in the graduate labour market is, the, is this notion of the half life. You know, how long does it take for half your graduate intake to have left? Um, and in good times that's five years in bad times it's 18 months two years so there are different ways of looking at you know the measures of labor turnover um but i guess my point was it's not as um vulnerable to you know big shifts as everyone seems to think um but your your substantive point is absolutely right Uh, you talk quite a bit about um, work from home and employers who think it's um, a bad thing and those who think it's a good thing. And you reference employees who know how to move their mouse every 30 minutes to show the employer they're doing something. Uh, do you not think that technology will fix this? Because we are not very far off more sophisticated solutions to know exactly what people are doing at home, not just moving the mouse, but using the camera to see the time in front of the screen, the keystrokes, yep. listening to what's going on in the room where the telly's on, the dog's there. You know, do you not think that that's where it's going to go? Because employers will not be able to resist uh, the ability to snoop into every aspect of what's going on in the home front. Yeah, I think that's partly true, um, but we've had that since you know, way before the pandemic. Um, you know, try and work in a call centre and not feel monitored or you know, have the amount of time you're allowed to spend to go to the loo, um, strictly cons constrained, look at warehousing uh, and so on. So you know, technology does allow that sort of surveillance. I mean, it does come down to trust though, doesn't it? And in the nature of the work that people are doing. Um, but it does seem to me that organisations who go straight for that option, uh, where they're making it clear that they're, you know, everything you do is being monitored, can't expect a massive amount of discretionary effort from people to go the extra mile when they need to. So it's back to again to the issues of culture, you know, EQ amongst line managers and so on. You know, these are all things that is about appropriateness and fitness for purpose. I think just because you have a technology available to you doesn't mean you need to use it um, in those sort of rather draconian ways. And I think enlightened organisations, and I, I, I think that most organisations are enlightened, will be able to resist that. And, and those who don't will, will actually suffer because you know, people won't stand for it. Uh, and if they have the opportunity to jump ship, they will, uh, because it's not part of the, you know, what they define as having a high quality of working life. Stephen, got one uh, question online from Shelley Watts. She's asking in relation to job design, comparing Gen Z with older workers, are there different job characteristics that hold greater importance in each category of worker? For example, autonomy, is it more important for older workers? Conversely, having purposeful work, or is this more important for younger workers? Um, short answer is not as much as you think. 
um, we did a study for the Centre for Aging Better, which was looking at um, what does good work mean um, for people in different generations? Um, and I've also been doing some work with um, Professor uh, Emma Parry at Cranfield University, um, which is looking at aspects of the future work. And our research shows really clearly that there aren't as many differences between the generational categories as, as everyone likes to think. Uh, there are more things that unite people across the generations in terms of what they want from their work. Um, there are some studies that suggest that older workers and younger workers have got a slightly um, more attached more importance to something, things like ethical performance of their organisation, whereas those people in mid career who are interested in, you know, more interested in pay and progression and so on. But in general, um, there are fewer differences between the generations than we've been led to believe. So I, I personally try and resist using terms like Gen X and Gen Y and millennials and boomers and so on, because I think it try it emphasises uh, differences that don't really exist at a fundamental level. Good. 